Good evening and welcome everyone. Good evening and welcome everyone. It's good to be here once Hi. again. Good evening, we can hear you. All right, good evening, HJP, good to see you. All right, so it's another evening. Mm. I'm sure we all had a good time in on media yesterday and misinformation, disinformation with Kemi Busari yesterday. It was a really, really pleasant experience and insightful today. It's another opportunity to learn. Let's remember our class rules. You come into the class, you place your name in the so as you, you would like to see it in the on your certificate once our semester or this cohort is over. Today, facilitators, we're talking about climate change and governance. Last cohort, uh, this was such a brilliant, a brilliant facilitation by our resource persons, and I'm quite confident that they're bringing their game game on this time around and it's going to be equally awesome so without wasting so much time i would i just like to confirm if they're in class so that i could go ahead to read their profiles we have ulu wali hammond and aisha to ella john to take us on this journey this evening i'll start with ladies first because well that's what we know all right so i'll start with our facilitator, Aisha to Ella John. She is a policy and advocacy strategist. Okay. She is a policy and advocacy strategist and a community development worker. Aisha to has several years of experience in community project implementation. She's interested in building a community that is aware of climate change. She's Climate, okay, let me take that again. She's interested in building a community aware climate smart Nigeria through capacity building and partnership development. She is the head of climate change at Clean Technology Hub. Amazing. And then alongside with her is Uluwele Hammond, who is a sustainability professional and a multimedia storyteller. With over four years of experience in planning, designing, and executing environmental and climate, climate related projects. He also works around the research intersecting renewable energy, climate change, and sustainability. Uluwale is keenly interested in promoting a sustainable environment, and he does this by using multimedia tools and storytelling to raise awareness of environmental and climate issues. And he has worked on various climate adaptation projects in Africa. A sound person, I must say. His goal is to see an environmentally conscious and climate smart generation. Wale is also interested in building innovative green solutions for the future. He is currently the deputy manager, environment and climate action at Clean Technology Hub. He is also a climate reality leader and a World Economic Forum Global Shaper. So we have this resource person from Clean Technology Hub to take us through this evening on climate change and governance. Please with a warm welcome. You can put it in the chat box, uh, emojis. Please let's welcome Aisha to Ella John and Uluwale Haman. Over to you, Sar and Ma. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you. Hello, Adishala. Thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure being here. And hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm Wally Amond, and it's great to be back on this platform where some few months ago with the previous course, and it was really interesting to share ideas and um, talk about how climate change relates to governance and the role everyone can play um, in shaping um, a green and sustainable future. So allow me to share my screen and we can start. All right, um, can everyone see my screen? You can put it in the chat box. 
let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Great, great. Thank you so much. All right. All right, so today I'll be learning on climate change and governance. And um, this is a really interesting topic because when you look at um, global development as well as relating to local context, you understand that um, topics around climate change, health, food security, uh, and technology are burning topics that everyone, everywhere is talking and doing something about. Um, so this class is, will be interactive. Um, together this uh, brief slides to just guide the conversation we'll be needing your input when especially so um, trust me this is going to be interesting all right so um and we'll be looking at it from a nigerian perspective because we are talking about we are nigerians talking about nigeria and looking to build a sustainable um, and well-developed nigeria so Everything here is localized and it relates to how issues of climate change relate to governance in Nigeria. All right. So uh, before we start, I'm going to play a short video for everyone. So please listen through and um, we'll kick off the conversation after. Please let me know if you can see and uh, hear the video. Thank you. Where the waves are breaking now is not where they used to break before. The shoreline used to be at least 30 to 50 meters out. The water is washing in, it's coming with great courage to wash out the Bonnie High Bank. And this one is not done properly. This Bonnie High Bank will be washed out. The ocean levels are going to rise substantially for Nigeria. A good portion of Lagos is going underwater. Our coastlines are going to be irrevocably changed. The rising sea level is rapid. Millions of people all over the world. The threatening environmental crisis that the world is facing, and that's climate change. This mangrove plant is very, very important to the coastal environment. It's one of the sea defenses that the country has, and it's being destroyed through its oil pollution. If you look at the level of oil spills going on in the United Delta. It's one of the largest levels in, in the world. Our farms are no longer working well. So it is a problem. Our land is wasted. It's totally condemned. In this community, over 180 children is affected by the By inhaling the dangerous fluid gas. The gas flowing in, in Nigeria is the largest contributor to CO2 in Africa. Only through natural absorbents. So this greenhouse gases is the plants, is the forests. So there are cartels operating. They do not want to give up that, that illegal revenue. And so they fight for decades. <laughs> dead area. Almost nothing will grow. You have erosion that's occurred. Kind of gone beyond the word erosion the world describing. The existence of humanity depends wholly on nature conservation. If you destroy the forest by destroying our chances of survival, planning opportunities. People now from the north will come down, and then people from the south will begin from the north. There's no way to run to. Once the damage is done, you can't put it back. And we're faced as humans with some very strong choices. Hi, everyone. I hope um, everyone saw the short video titled Nowhere to Run. We talked about Nigeria's climate and environmental crisis. All right, so I just want to take one or two comments um, who can briefly share what they learned from 
this video as it relates to climate change and Nigeria. Um, anyone who is willing to share with me. And in case you can't speak, you can put it in the comments and the chat. Thank you. All right, James, um, I'm asking you to unmute. Yeah, go ahead, James. All right, thank you, sir. I think um, from the short video clip, um, climate change is everybody's business. And so everybody should be concerned about it. Whether you, whether, whether you are in a region A and you feel it's happening, you or W, one way or the other, it will affect everybody. So it should be everybody's business as much as governance is everybody's business. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. That was really concise. It's everyone's problem. You could be in this region and you feel you're shielded, but the truth is um, it affects you because it affects others, it affects you. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul, yes, Paul Chidi, go ahead, please. Okay, good evening. Um, the short video was um, a little bit um, skipping, but I was able to understand that climate is everyone's business, whether you are rich or poor, even every region, the east, south, west, north, south. And when it's changed, it affects both the rich and the poor. So it's something we should learn about as what I understood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. That, that's really helpful. Thank you for that. And I can share the link to the full video so that when anybody has time, they can really just uh, take some, I think it's about 45 minutes. It's an interesting video, you should see. Um, so climate change is everyone's problem, rich, poor, male, female. Um, wherever you are, there is a particular problem that um, climate change can exacerbate and really cause damage to our ecosystems, to our livelihoods, and to people generally. So we go ahead with the class. All right. Wait, so let, let's start by setting the context, um, by learning what is the environment. And the environment is basically everything that surrounds us, uh, which includes all the living, non-living, if you remember our basic science classes, um, talking about the biotic, the biotic. So the plant, the animals, water, everything relates to the environment. And the environment is really important because it's man's home. It's where we are able to live, work, our social activities, trade and commerce happens within the environment. In fact, I would say even our wealth from the mineral resources to everything we have comes from the environment. So the environment is really important and it's something everyone should take seriously. Then, um, and this is just to set the context so that by the time we begin to use some of these uh, terminologies, you are able to relate with them. So climate change in itself, I'm sure Everyone has had or at some point, maybe in the newspaper, maybe you've seen pictures of protests, people demanding there's no planet B and things like that. And you're wondering what's really climate change. So it refers to the long-term change in weather patterns. And the most interesting thing about climate change is that there are some natural components that cause climate change, but most, the major um, factor that has caused climate change over the years is human action. Our actions have been the dominant cause of climate change. And in, um, in our sector, it's referred to anthropogenic climate change because it is caused by humans. And we'll learn more about that as we go. And um, building on the last slide, this shows us the key sectors that emit the most. So climate change happens because um, human beings are burning fossil fuel, engaging in deforestation and industrial practices that contribute to climate change. So energy relating to what we use at home, what we use at work, industry from our factories that produce and manufacture goods from cars to fertilizers and many more, they all emit um, carbon um, and other greenhouse gases. Even in our agricultural sector, so as we deplete the forest and um, are working to create food from both livestock to arable crops, emissions take place because plants themselves 
as as a store for cardboard. But by the time we clear land cover, fall, um, we cut down trees, we, that, um, um, the carbon stored in them is going back into the environment. Also transportation, as we fly, we sail, we go with our vehicles, and I think it's easy to use vehicles. The exhaust, um, which popularly popular you know, as a carbon monoxide, CO, is, is a warming gas. So things like that come together, and we are known as greenhouse gases that um, are emitted into the atmosphere, thereby causing global warming. So it's interesting to learn that um, looking at both historic and current emission data for greenhouse gases, Africa is the least contributor to global emission. So Africa as a continent contributes less than 5% of what um, of greenhouse emissions, which means Africa's contribution to climate change over the years is so small. But the thing is, Africa is one, and if not the most vulnerable continent. So when we are talking about increasing um, weather patterns, increasing temperature happening in Europe and the like, it means it will be times two in Africa. So Africa is vulnerable. It affects us in a lot of ways. And this is what this class is about, to help us further understand it and help us begin to take it serious and make plans. So you can see in this data, USA emits a lot of data about, about 400 billion tons of CO2. Um, China, Europe, um, Asia, um, India, and this small box right here, the 1 billion plus people in Africa are only responsible for less than 5% now, just uh, permit me to go through some of these common terms so that by the time you uh, hear them repeatedly, you will uh, really understand them. So global warming simply refers to, and this is one of the resources we've created at Winter Club, which is known as the ABC of Climate Change. And um, it will soon be featured on our website. And once it's available, I think you can download it because it's very easy to use to understand the key terminologies relating to climate change. So global warming is, the gradual increase in global temperature and over the past years it has resulted in, which has resulted from um, GHG, which is greenhouse gases emissions. And greenhouse gases themselves are gases that warm the atmosphere. So you will see that if you stand close to an exhaust pipe or a generator of a car, it is warm uh, because of the warming gas it's capable of, it's also known as a greenhouse gas. So others include methane, um, natural oxide and hydrocarbons. Um, so there's also a term known as mitigation. Mitigation simply means any action that you can use to reduce or palliate climate change through the reduction of greenhouse gases. So if you are able to reduce greenhouse gases, you are mitigating climate change. Adaptation, on the other hand, is refers to any social or economic or ecological response that we do. So if we are able to we shape our agriculture to be resilient to climate change. That means we are adapting to climate change in agriculture. Um, climate justice refers to is is it more of a justice and equity uh, terminology relating that people who have contributed the least and are most vulnerable also deserve um, okay. to be compensated and their human rights upheld because climate change is also. A social human rights issue because it affects people, especially the most vulnerable, who have the least resources, the least technology, the least capacity to adapt to its impact. So climate justice is a, is a cause for social justice. Um, Conference of Parties, COP. Uh, so COP is the supreme governing uh, body, uh, the governing convention for climate change, and it is held annually. So um, COP is where the various Conveyed by the UN, the various nations of the world, corporate institutions come together, um, civil society and other observers come together to deliberate on what people are doing with those climate change. And some of the popular COP you would remember, um, the one in Kyoto, um, the recent one um, in UK, which was held last year, which was COP26. And there's also the popular um, Paris Agreement, which was the COP that held in Paris in 2015, where about, about 150 nations coming together to ratify the Paris Agreement that seeks to limit uh, climate change to 1.5 degrees of uh, uh, pre-industrial temperatures. 
Um, so the next COP, which is happening this year in November, will be happening with COP um, with Sham El Shei in Egypt. So it's being hosted on African soil. And the Africans are pushing the narrative that it's important that we demand what we um, I think someone's mic is on. Please, can you please? Thank you. So the next COP is happening in November this year, and I think you should follow that because um, Nigeria is an important nation on Africa, so we'll be able to represent it there and we'll continue to demand um, for things related to climate change. So we've learned about these terminologies. What are then the effects of climate change on environment and people? So um, some key noticeable events um, that we will relate with are increase in temperature. We would agree with you, some, maybe some people would agree with you, that especially during the peak period of the dry season, March, April, the strong heat waves and the increase in temperature we experienced lately is really more than what we, what we maybe experienced a, a decade ago. There's also the issue of drought, where especially in the arid and semi arid regions, which increase. Uh, rainfall is increasing in scars, which affects food and even life in the future. There's also changing patterns of rainfall where you feel okay, the rain at this point should be ending, but you see that it falls a lot and you're like, how is it raining like this almost the October? Um, and this leads into what we know as rising sea level, which is more prominent in coastal areas where because glaciers are melting, there's increased flooding. The ocean itself is really uh, increasing, and it it comes in to displace um, the shorelines, causing sea level rise and um, the associated coastal erosion. There's also flooding. Um, so because of the changing patterns, we really can't predict rainfall. We can't even predict the intensity of rainfall. We see that um, flooding uh, really occurs, and this is a very important topic for climate change in Nigeria because the affects us in because it relates to our urban system. Okay, I can see that I'm not audible enough. Please, thank you for letting me know. All right, thank you for that. Please let me know if you can hear me now. Thank you. All right, um, so we also have, um, like I mentioned, challenges of flooding, which is important. Um, and Desertification is also a problem, especially relating to um, the Sahel region. So um, the nations closer to the desert, we see the desert really encroaching into these areas, thereby displacing especially the indigenous communities who once lived in these areas. So this is important um, because the northern part of Nigeria falls within this zone. And it is important that adaptation takes place for us to be able to address the challenge of climate change in the region. And there are other secondary effects that then build up on this. And my colleague Aisha too, will be taking us through the step-by-step -step with real life uh, examples and scenarios on how um, food insecurity, displacement and uh, forced migration, competition for natural resources is increasing. There's also air challenges because as the temperature gets warmer, um, there are diseases that really thrive in that. There's also the loss of biodiversity. And when we lose biodiversity, it means um, human lives and livelihoods are really at stake. So I'm going to also play this short video after which my colleague Aisha to take us through the remaining part of the presentation. And this is relating to um, climate change and food security. And because Food is really important. I think everybody must have had at least uh, breakfast and lunch today. So food is important. So how does Nigeria's food security look like uh, in a changing climate? So um, please listen, watch and listen to this video and um, Aisha to take it over. Thank you. Is life, food is celebration, food is culture, and food is found in everything we need, all our ceremonies. And in the year 2050, we will be about 400 people. 
the juice. Easier to be functional and to eat agriculture better. Structure is also a really big issue. It's been destroyed over the last few years. Climate change is even bigger. Coming together, that's sort of like the perfect storm. We have about 40% post harvest losses in the country. Why should this happen? In a country where there are some people. Looking for food. They can't store it because they have a limit. are 20% farmers of other uh, in other regions. Listen, don't pour the oil. No. When they come, when they bring the crops, they are crazy. Farmers are not sure when the rainy season starts, but when it ends. And uh, if you don't know when the rains are going to come, when they bring the crops, they are crazy planting and harvesting cycle. Nigeria is the largest importer of tomato paste in the world. In terms of the actual volume of tomato paste, it could fill the Empire State Building twice. Nigeria is getting yields that are 20% of farmers in other, uh, in other regions. Uh, listen, don't pour the oil. No credit to it. If you enter that point of oil, you can't see anything. The grasslands of Nigeria can barely support maybe about 40% of Nigerian livestock. There are huge potential there and huge opportunities for young people is finding that job. I think there's such a young population in Nigeria. If we invest in that, the sky's the limit. Urban farming, creative farming. We are young people from all varieties of professions that are making uh, and forging business. Nigeria needs to act immediately to address the challenges of food security. A major concern and worry is whether we will act the right way. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for the video quality. Yes. So sorry for the video quality. Um, can you let me know if you can hear me loud and clear? Yes, I can. Yes, we okay. can. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so you may be wondering, you joined this class to learn uh, about politics and governance, and we are here talking about climate change. What does climate change have to do with governance? As well, this is the second part of the presentation I'm taking. Um, I, I went around, I did a little uh, stroll around your profiles while you were, while uh, Wally was presenting, and I saw that most of you um, either aligned to a political party or contesting for office. Anyway, so why, the question again, why climate change and governance? Because in the next 10 years, um, these five key discussions will, will somebody's mic is on, so I'm getting um, distracted. Okay, in the next um, 10 years, these five topics are going to dominate um, discussions or conversations around the world. The first topic is post-COVID recovery, how our economy is recovering after um, COVID, because almost all, all the countries in the world shut down for half part of the half a half a year, and that had huge impacts on the economy, the aviation industry, and a lot of other industries. So, how are countries recovering after COVID? Then security. Uh, we have the Ukraine-Russia war. We have the now we have the issue, the issue that came up that is coming up in Iran. In Nigeria, we cannot even name the number of security challenges we have. Across Africa, Mali, um, we can say our former president always going there. So security is a concern around the world. 
Then food security, food security too. We have shortages, food shortages, not just in Nigeria, but in other parts of the world, food bills are going or higher than ever before. And technology. Um, technology, um, especially after COVID, this is part of the post-COVID recovery. During and after, during COVID, technology took a huge turn. We discovered that we didn't have to attend every meeting physically. We didn't have to work, go to work every day physically. And uh, a lot of the activities we do that we normally did physically, we can now do by technology. And beyond just communication technology, the technology affects security, affects um, uh, even agriculture, and technology is going to play a huge part of our, of our lives. Now everybody wants, is moving from being a doctor, lawyer, to wanting to be a coder, so that they can, they say data is a new oil, so that they can benefit from, from technology. Then climate change. The climate is changing. We are seeing the effects. And we have to now prepare. We have to prepare for those effects. I think the slides are going a little too fast. Yes. Um, a few weeks ago, I think a week ago, one of the front running presidential candidates was asked the question on um, energy trans green, tra green energy transition of Nigeria. And he was very honest and upfront about it. And he said he, he wasn't aware. But I noticed that a few days after that, he did some posts about on climate change, which means he had gone to read up on this and he had learned and he, had, he was now sharing. So that is a very important, that is one of the issue reasons why as um, people who are going into political office, you should learn about climate change and you should have a fair information, fair knowledge of climate change because every sector you do, every sector you are, it affects it. From Kebi, Castina, their climate change issues, to Benue, um, Kaduna, their climate change issues, to Bayelsa and um, Bayelsa and Portacot, they are also climate change issues. Let's not even talk about Lagos and the annual flooding. And next slide, please, Wally. Okay, so climate change is not just an environmental issue, but a governance issue. A changing climate affects different aspects of human endeavors and the state. A changing climate affects um, security because you now have people migrating from one part of the country to the other. And we are all aware of what we are going through, the farmer's header slashes, which has now uh, spiral, spir spiraled into the, a full kidnapping emergency. Climate change affects health too, because um, some illnesses are associated with changes in extreme changes in weather. It affects transportation. It affects housing because as people move, uh, once we, when we have uh, climate related issues, you have people moving from far north to the center and you find people, um, people would need a place to stay, especially those who are moving from IDP camp. So I've gathered money and they will need a place to stay. And more and more we are felling trees and we are building houses. Are we following the, proce the processes, the city plans for building these houses? That is another issue. Climate change affects migration because as um, resources dry up, as there's drought, as um, sea levels, uh, as we are having right rising sea levels and flood, people move from those areas to the drier lands. And so that uh, is migration. Climate change affects the economy generally. It also affects vulnerable groups the most, women, children, indigenous communities, the elderly, I had to learn that recently, and the young, the young population. Next slide. So how does climate change affect food systems? 90% um, of the farmers we have in Nigeria depend on unirrigated plots. From the documentary, the, um, if some of you could pick a few, of, a few of what was audible. This was, I think the video was done in 2012 or 2009. I can't remember. I don't, I'm trying to get the air. And they said, if we do not do something fast, we will all um, we will get to a point of a food emergency. And we didn't do anything, and we are at the point of food emergency. Because farmers rely on unirrigated plots, they rely on rainfall. And now we can see how the rainfall comes. Sometimes they come, um, they start when they are not supposed to, start. they start too early, and they go dry, and they stop, and they now come very high. The patterns are not predictable. And so when you have farmers relying on that rainfall and not irrigation, it's really upsets the it really upsets the, 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 the harvest 
we have dry spells and we have rainy season and we have flooding. Um, I was reading a few days ago, farmers were advised to start harvesting in, um, I think it was Kogyo Plateau, to avoid total loss because they are expecting flooding in a few days. And Nema's outlook for flood in, 20, a flood in 2023 shows that 223 local government areas in 32 states and the FCT fall under the risk of highly probable flood risk areas. Tomato yields for this year is predicted to be short by 25% due to climate change. And we know how tomato goes up, the cost of tomato goes up seasonally because of these issues. Casina already reported the loss of 1,754,000 metric tons of grains to drought caused close by climate change in 2021. So we already have over 1.7 million food shortage from just one state, not to talk of the other states. The, um, this, the loss of these agricultural products is projected to cost Nigeria between 6 to 30% of Nigeria's GDP, GDP in 2050 because we are a highly agrarian society. And uh, beyond these figures, we are all feeling the effects of food shortages as witnessed by the rising cost of foodstuff. So who can tell me how much is a bag of rice now? Any volunteers? James, please go ahead. Okay, Choma says she bought for 32K, 32,000. James, go ahead, unmute yourself and respond. Uh, Oyi Kansola said um, she buys it for 100,000. Niman Emmanuel said, um, 30,000. James, I'm still waiting for you. You can unmute yourself and respond. Okay. So, James, I think James will be having issues on meeting himself. I think 36,000. 36,000 in your own area. Where do you live, James? It's Abuja. Okay, Abuja. We have it, it ranges between 30, 30 to 36,000. And that's even for local rice. So James, what was what, your food bill like monthly compared to 2015, 2014? It's it's over a 100% increment. Yes, it's, over, it's more than a 100% increment. And this is because one, they are, even though there are other issues, but farmers are, are struggling because there are a lot of this food shortage. And um, are, uh, caused by drought in some places and flooding in some other places. So there's no fixed price. It keeps fluctuating with each shopping trip. Yes, I agree. Honestly, I don't even make a list again when I go to the market. So this is we can feel. We can all feel the effects of climate change on on uh, on uh, on our food system. Next slide, please. Insecurity. I don't even think we need to speak a lot about this one because we are all feeling the heat. Um, for those of us in the north and Abuja, I think a few weeks ago, all of us were scared because we had some, some in our some areas there were gunshots. There is a lot of general insecurity across the country. There's kidnapping, but how did that? How did the, how did insecurity um, start and, and spiral into spiral into this situation we are? First of all, there was loss of livelihood. Um, let's start start from Boko Haram and shrinkage of the Lake Chad of the Chad Basin. For those of us who know Meduguri and uh, Borno State generally, not Meduguri, um, in the 80s, the Lake Chad used to be a very, very booming area. People came from the south, from the east, from the south south to buy fish there. Yeah, there was a huge, it was a huge lake with a lot of fish, different species of fish, but predominantly local um, um, uh, freshwater catfish. And those catfish, they were normally caught and um, smoked and sold across Nigeria and even Africa. Um, Borno was a huge market um, to Chad, to Niger, to Cameroon, because it bordered this street and other parts of Africa. The so people came from far and near to buy fish, because I know I had relatives who will come to buy this fish and they will stay there. But sometime around um, the, late, the late 80s and early 90s, they started shrinking. And when it started shrinking, fishermen started losing their livelihoods there. 
the areas you this is people that were in those areas that was the profession that they knew young people older people that's the profession that they knew but gradually it started shrinking so you find villages that were fish, fish uh, um, areas that were dominated by fishermen now losing their livelihood and they started moving to the city centers and um by the 90s by the late 90s it became very it became worse and they started moving to the city centers without a source of livelihood and they went and they said, uh, listening to this Yusuf Ali guy, who was providing them at least a place to stay and food. And we know how the story ended. And we are now in a 10 year war, 10 year plus war with Boko Haram. Then the drought in the Northwest, cattle herders started moving down south in search of water and pasture for their, castle, their cattle. But because uh, of the nature of their, of their um, profession and nature of their work, they were now uh, getting into farmers, uh, into farmers' uh, land, and farmers were also getting into their, getting on their grazing routes. So we have had, we had the farmer headers conflict, and we've had a lot of back and forth on that. And now it's no longer just the farmers headers conflict. We are now having, um, even this, even some of these um, armed headsmen turning into kidnappers. And we are, in a whole, we are in a whole circle of security issues. Then we also have the Niger Delta conflict. From the issues of, from the challenge of, um, from the challenges, okay. We also have the Niger Delta, uh, Niger Delta, I think the slides are going a little fast, Wally. We may have to go back, yeah. From the issues, from the challenge of, um, from the challenges we had in Niger Delta, we had Niger Delta militancy, and we knew how that went to. So those are all. If you if you want to um, solve a situation, um, solve an issue, you go to the root causes, and you can see that most of these security challenges have their have their roots in climate change issues. Next slide, please. Yes. So for um, healthcare, a lot of diseases that we we witness now are linked to climate changes in the climate. When we have extreme heat, we have um, younger children developing cerebral spinal meningitis. Uh, we have skin cancers, especially for people with albinism and other people, and, and not just people with albinism. Malaria, um, when we have uh, flooding and stagnant water, and when people have to sleep outside because of the heat. And high blood pressure is also linked to increase in temperature. For the elderly and women, for the elderly it's worse because when there's extreme, extreme cold or extreme flooding, movement and um, when there's extreme cold and extreme flooding, we know how the elderly react. So these are all issues that, these are all health implications of climate change. And we already know that our health institutions are already um, overstretched. So when we now have a breakout in the meningitis or cholera, we know how we, we've seen pictures of how our health, our hospitals, we have people on the floor taking drip in some hospitals in the in some parts of the country. Next slide, please. Okay, so watch this video. Hopefully the audio will be better and we'll continue. Our video is misbehaving, so let's go to our next slide. Yes, um, internal displacement and frontline communities, desertification and coastal displacement. Yes, sorry about that. We've uh, skipped the video, so we'll just go ahead with our presentation. So, um, how does climate change affect infrastructure? 
when we have the desertification and coastal displacement, when we have flooding or rising sea levels like in Lagos, people have to move from the flooded areas to dry areas. And we are having that scenario now in, in, in Jigawa. People who do not move, some, the government will be begging people, please move so that move and be alive so that you don't, uh, you, the flood doesn't come and take you at night. But people do not have anywhere to move to. So some people will say, I let them stay and whatever happens, let it happen. So we've had, uh, we are having serious cases of flooding in Jigawa, Adamawa and Yobe, which has led to uh, the death of over 500 people and the displacement of over 10,000 in the last uh, two months. But even beyond coastal displacement, we have migration from the flooded areas to, to where are people moving to? They are moving to city centers, like I said. They are taking shelter in heated to green areas. And especially in Abuja, you notice a rise in um, housing estates. But when these estates are coming, what do they do? They just they go into areas that were normally green or this cashew, there were a lot of cashew plantations and they cut those trees down and they start building houses, start building estates. Do they, um, do they um, keep some areas green in those estates? Not every estate does that. They just want to get as much land as possible. In some cases, they even sand fill some parts of the land that are, are lakes or waterways and they build on it. Then we also have um, digging of boreholes because um, what is supposed to be under the master plan is that you have 20 meter apart uh, boreholes. But what we have now is that everybody just comes and they just start digging their borehole because they want water. They, they, have, they, have, they have cut off the trees, now they need water. And they start digging their boreholes indiscriminately. Just a few estates um, insist on that policy and keep it. And I don't think the FCT administration is doing much to implement that. A few years ago, I last year in Abuja, we had air tremors. And we have been wondering that that is going to be getting worse because of this um, unregulated digging that we are doing. So extreme weather conditions can have very devastating effects on infrastructure, such as roads. Because once there's flooding, we know that our roads are washed away. And even after the flood, the roads hardly get back to their, to their, to their, to their former states. Next slide, please. Okay, yes. So this is very, uh, this is something I'm very passionate about, and I, we have a whole topic on this. It was actually what we wanted to do, but we've been very uh, tied, a little tied down at work, so we are not able to do. So climate change and the vulnerable population. For the vulnerable population, we classify um, the elderly. We have people with disability. We have women and we have children. We also classify young people. That's a youth from 18 to, I won't say 35, but young people who are also affected by effects of climate change. So this is an IDP camp in um, Kaduna State. Um, this the last count was done. Uh, this is just one camp, not the whole, not the camp for the whole of Kaduna. This is just one camp. So um, this was done in, a head count was done on 12th of April, 2022. They had 823 men, 1,209 women, 1,814 children, 25 pregnant women, and, and 17 people with disability. So you can imagine for a person with disability, especially a person with a, a working impairment, when the flood comes, and somebody, somebody that uses maybe an electric wheelchair or maybe a manual wheelchair, how do they start getting on their wheelchair to run? And for people with visual impairment, who are used to taking, because maybe they are already gone, they are already used to taking a certain route with their working kings to their house. And but when it's now flooded or when there are issues of erosion, how do they now find their way without help? Um, there was a story um, the Radi executive secretary told us about a, an old man. And this is not just a story, this is something that happened. This was actually an issue that needed intervention. There was this old elderly man. He um, heard men attack them at night. He woke up in the morning. He just didn't see anybody in the whole community. And he's a hunter. He didn't see anybody. So he was wondering what happened because he has hearing impairments. He didn't know what happened at night. And somehow they didn't even come and, and look for him. So he just picked his den gun and started working to, to let him walk to the next village where his daughter is. 
And that's how uh, soldiers caught him because he was holding a gun gun and there had just been an attack. And he was just kept in prison for over two months till somebody in the community went to do something in the prison and saw him there. And they had to now go to court and had to do a lot of a whole a whole long procedure before he was released after four months. So you can imagine how it is for somebody like that. How do you even know that there's danger to escape? How do you even know that? How even if you know that there's danger, how do you even escape if you have if you're a person with disability? Then for pregnant women, you are just <laughs> so there, 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 there are so many, it is it, it, really is there are so many angles to look at this for pregnant women. How do you start running? And even if you start running, you are out of the comfort of your home. You are not attending continental. You are. You may even give birth in an IDIDP camp. So these are some of the issues. These are some of the populations, vulnerable populations that we see. And for the elderly, some cases their mobility is reduced and they can't even move and run when there's danger or when there's flooding. And we now have a lot of mortality for the elderly and this vulnerable population in um, in, in cases of uh, in, in when climate when we have uh, secondary effects of climate change. Next slide, please. So we've said all the issues. So how is Nigeria uh, responding to climate change? So Nigeria has, uh, Nigeria has a national adaptation strategy and plan of action on climate change. This was, signed, this is, was developed in 2011. Ratification of the Paris Agreement in 20, 2017 and the uh, updated national determined contribution to reduce the greenhouse effect, greenhouse gas effect emission, greenhouse gas emission to 20% and 47% conditional with financial and technology transfer from developed economies at, by 2020. The summary of this English is that Nigeria has a plan to reduce the effects of climate change. In 2021, which is one of the biggest achievements for us is that um, a climate change law was signed in 2021. And this, form, this includes the formation of a National Council of Climate Change. It's supposed to be chaired by the president and headed by a director general. The law also introduced carbon budgets. Carbon budget doesn't mean money. It means that every organization, every um, institution, every company will have a certain amount of carbon that they are going to emit for that year. And if you pass that emission for that year, you are, going to be, you are going to pay a fine, which is called the carbon tax. The vision of Nigeria's climate change policy is a low carbon resilient Nigeria. Next slide, please. So um, we have the National Development Plan uh, 2021 to 2025 is the framework for Nigeria's green transition, which was the question they asked um, the, the candidates. And initiatives such as the National Nigeria Circular Growth Economic Working Group, uh, headed by the federal government and African Development Bank, is, yet, is meant to produce a 10 year transition plan to a green economy. And uh, a green economy is a whole different topic. We'll maybe another class, maybe next, next time we'll take that, we'll take a green economy. Organizations like our own Clean Technology Hub have made inroads in leading advocacy, research, incubation of green enterprises gender and youth inclusion in transition to a green economy, a green Nigeria economy. Next slide, please. So how are we, how are we physically um, handling our transition? So clean energy, we are moving, we are trying to move. I'm not saying we are moving yet because there's still a lot of work to be done. We are trying to move from um, using fossil fuel and traditional methods of um, fueling, uh, um, um, getting energy to um, rural, rural electrification. Dr uh, the Rural Electrification Agency is driving an off-grid rural electrification through the Nigeria Electrical uh, Electrification Project and Solar Power Niger, targeting 5 million new solar connections in 2023. For transportation, the transition to a green transportation has been considerably slower. Uh, their initiatives, their individual initiatives that have come to spotlight. Um, we know of Telsa, Telsa cars by, um, what's his name in the US? Elon Musk. Elon Musk. But in Nigeria, we also have our own Elon Musk. I won't say our own Elon Musk. We have our own Mustafa Gajibu and a few others that are pushing um, this electric, move to electric vehicles. Like Mustafa Gajibu, you may Google him after this. He is um, 
um, converted a lot of vehicles to electric vehicles, and he moved to Borneo State to, operate, to be operational there because of the, the, the solar, because of the sun, the sun that he can get there. So these buses have their charging stations. Instead of using fuel, they go to the charging stations and they charge for a while and they now run for a, they have been operational for a, a while in Medjugorje. And recently he was able to um, fully develop, the, the work he was doing before was conversion to electric buses, but he was able to fully develop a bus from start that is an electric vehicle. And there are a lot of others that are also doing this, it's something similar, but he is more, his own is more operational. So for agriculture, we have reforestation programs, ranching, smart agriculture, soilless farming. Um, you may want to Google Samson or Gwole. We will have put the video, video here, but we are worried about the, um, is it not uh, showing? Soilless farming, where they use um, water, uh, rich nutrient water to farm. You don't farm with the soil, you use um, some, the, some the, 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 the just plants, hang the plants upside down, up, hang the plants and the plants grow and just feed it with nutrients and water. So you don't have that issue of, oh, farmers and headers are dragging land because it is not even planted on the soil or the soil degradation by use, um, use of uh, continuous use of fertilizer and excessive use of the land. Water saving irrigation, recycling farm waste. So instead of burning farm waste, like a, a rice ripe, ripe shaft, we use it also for we use it we use it also for, for this soilless farming because instead of using soil you can use those shafts to plant your seeds and then um, this all these efforts are towards a more predictable and insurable farm production system because insurance companies do not want to uh, insure agricultural companies because of the unpredictable nature of uh, the food systems next slide please clean cooking um a deadline of 20 has been set by uh, the federal government to end tourism use. I know a lot of questions and anger will be on this one because we are not, we are just, government is setting timelines and not doing anything to ensure that uh, <coughs> this is actually done. End tourism, firewood, and call for cooking. These methods not only harm the environment, but also hurt, hurt women's health. Clean technology has been involved with, in training and helping women access clean cooking stoves. Um, for women who um, fry akara on the roadside, there's research to show that a lot of them have developed um, respiratory issues and also asthma and other health complications because of the con continuous inhalation of smoke, firewood uh, smoke and uh, smoke by coal. In waste management, the federal government approved the plastic waste management policy. It pilots plastic recycling plants with the aim of recycling over 200,000 plastic tons of waste. Um, we can argue on how far that has gone. <laughs> Next slide, please. So with a lot of this, we still have a long way to go, even though, even with the government efforts, we have to, and we have to speak about the issue of loss and damages. Those who have lost their farmlands to climate change issues, how do they recover? Because insurance companies will not agree to insure um, farm, uh, farm, um, um, farm, farm, farms and farm produce. How do they recover their losses? Damages. Then, uh, if you are telling me to leave my my generator and move to solar, how do I recover my expenses? These are a lot of the debates that are going on. And as we go to COP twenty seven, COP twenty seven in Egypt, Africa uh, Clean Technology Hub is also leading a CSO forum. Well, we'll make some of these positions known. So that it doesn't just be the first, it's not just the first world countries going to debate and uh, keeping resources for themselves. We have to keep Africa on the front, front, front line on these issues. Because if you are going to transition, you're telling people not to farm, um, not to use certain methods of farming that they've been using for donkey years. There has to be a way for them to recover their losses and move transition to green to, 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 to green to a green Nigeria. Insurance cover for inadequate insurance cover, like we said, insurance companies do not like ag agri farming. But if we move to more predictable uh, ways of farming, we could have some changes. Poor awareness. Um, I don't even know why we didn't have our poll before we started. And this is not just restricted to you. We've been to offices. That is offices of uh, people who work in our sector, the NGO sectors. 
and you tell you that it's climate change happening in Nigeria. Is it not an voting? And this is all round. Because even in our meeting with uh, the uh, chairman house committee on climate change, that is the challenge he's always facing. When he writes to sector heads, they come and start fighting him that, okay, why are you calling me to come? What's my own with climate change? What's my ministry's own with climate change? I have to take them through. We are heading a security agency. What is all this insecurity that's happening? It's not related to climate change. These ships that you have, these uh, naval warships that you have, I didn't know I'm meeting um, GHG. So there's a lot of poor awareness and a lot of misconception about climate change being, an, <coughs> being a foreign problem, not a Nigerian problem. Sorry. <coughs> then we have the economic downturn. Um, COVID really dealt a, a huge one on the, a lot of world economies. But beyond that, Nigeria also had her own issues. So when you're telling people now to convert to this, convert to that, oh, don't use this, don't use that. It is not um, economically realistic for now. Then insecurity. Because even for us, some of our solutions <coughs> are now bringing more insecurity. Let's say, let me, for example, reforestation. Where we have, um, <coughs> sorry, where we built, where we um, planted a lot of trees, especially in the Northwest, to reclaim, <coughs> to reclaim the um, desert, um, desert areas. Planted a lot of trees, and we now had mini forests. And what is happening to those mini forests now? Bandits are now occupying those forests. So what was supposed to be a solution to climate change is now a problem, becoming a problem to us. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Simon. Thank you. I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm drinking my water. <laughs> okay. So um, we are going to have a, 50, a a ten minute discussion where we are going to brainstorm individually. After we have listed all these problems and we have listed some of the issues that we are facing with climate change, as we plan to get into office. And as you plan, maybe you may not even be in office, but you may be an advisor to somebody in office. What will you do differently to protect the environment and reduce the effects of climate change? Okay, so the the task is for one who would yes. like to. No. Yes, it's a discussion. Yeah, session. a brainstorming okay. session. Okay. All right, so do we have, I'm tempted to call on. We have Kelechi. We have Kelechi we have and uh, we have James. Please, um, all that's participate. Kelechi, we have Choma. Yeah. So, so let's, let's uh, go Kelechi first. Okay. okay, so hello everyone. Good evening. Thank you, Aisha and Wale for the insightful lecture so um what would i do differently i think i would reduce my carbon footprint hello can you hear me am i audible yes 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 you okay can. great so as an individual okay so as an individual i think reducing my carbon footprint is a major change i mean learning to travel light because we know that with all of the travel and the gas emission there are just smarter ways to get things done um, I would say that I would want to reduce air travel, but because of insecurity, <laughs> nobody is about to be going from state to state, especially when there's an airport or, or, or what's it called, or a train station, right, to expose myself to unnecessary, the unnecessary insecurity. But yes, reducing my carbon footprint is um, something I would actively work towards. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kelechi. That's 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 very that's a very uh, practical step. Thank you, James. You want to go next? All right. Um. Thank you very much for the insightful class. Okay. For me personally, I think the most important thing that needs attention now is awareness. You know, um, a lot of people in Nigeria when we see variations in okay, it's supposed to rain heavily August or it normally rains heavily in August and it's, not, it's no longer raining heavily in August. It's now October or November. We are quick to associate such to God. We say, ah, so it's God that owns rain and he decides to supremacy 
and he choose when the rain falls and when rain does not fall. So there's a lot of um, knowledge gap on the consequences of climate change. So personally, I, I'm more interested in having um, on this climate change issues. And this should be done, which it should be to people in the rural community and everybody, you know, as prices of things, inflation is getting high, men considering the usage of gas for charcoal. And in the long run, we don't know we are actually even doing ourselves more harm with that option. So I think awareness, if I find myself in any position as an individual, or if I'm occupying any public office, I want to pay attention to awareness. Okay. Is it just me or we lost James? But well, thank you, James. So we have um, reducing carbon footprints and we have awareness from James. Shama, you want to go next? Yes, um, good evening. And um, thanks for the beautiful lecture that you delivered and your colleague too. Um, as the lecture was going on, I was putting, I put down two points when you talked about borehole. And then I was like, if um, the, the borehole thing, individuals don't know how to source for water, what next? Water is an essential commodity for human survival. And we live in a community where if you don't source for your own water, nobody does it for you. So how will people begin to um, not to have their own bore, individual boreholes? An individual borehole is really creating an environmental disaster, which many people don't know. Then another thing I was I wanted to ask, but since I've been given this opportunity to talk, what is uh, or what are individual contributions? Was we found out that in Nigeria, many people think that oh, environmental um, or whatever, global climate change is a global thing. I don't have any part to play. I don't have any role to play. Nothing, nothing. But we forget that it is an individual contribution that is making the climate to change. Your role, my part, whatever thing we are doing is what is causing the changes in the environment that we have today. So I think like the last person said, creating awareness. If I occupy any position today, I will start from the rural areas. You see bush burning. People, every farming season, people set bushes on fire. Every dry season, my place every Christmas, whether they are doing it, they will just set places on fire and you just see flames like that going up. And they don't know the adverse effect of this thing that they are doing. Most of them you tell them, they say, it's not, it's not us. It's all these industrialized nations that are doing all these things. No, but if individuals can know that I have a role to play, you have a role to play, that individually, if we play our role to safeguard our environment, then we have a safe place to stay. So if I'm occupying any position today, I would like to create that individual awareness that I have a part to play in uh, combing this uh, um, environmental degradation we are having, this glo uh, global climate change that we are having, that every person has a role to play to make sure that uh, it doesn't get worse than it is now. Thank you. Hello, did you hear me? Yes, thank you very much, thank Roma. You. Yeah, you are yeah, right. very right on all counts. You know, so just to answer your question quickly on um, digging of borehole. So yeah. what estates can do is that they can have a central borehole where they now centralize and pump water to individual houses. So if you live in an estate that is organized, they can have that one or two or three based on the, the meter specifications. And that's how organized, because we're not an organized society, we don't do a lot of this. That's how organized societies function, so that they can now pump the water into the houses. That is if you do not get water directly from the, the state water boards. Okay, can I contribute to that? Like um, the village yes, where I come from, in my village, my own family, the extended family, at the time we had uh, one borehole that was connected to everybody's house. Somebody mm. just dug the borehole and connected to everybody's house. But the challenge you have is one, when there is no Nepal light, mm. who will bring out their generator to pump the water? Two, the person that the house was housing the main borehole, she detects mm. when to open the main control. <laughs> so, yes, at that point, I, I really had to dig for my parents yeah. because my parents yes. are aged. When I saw them carrying but I said, how can my parents, I can afford to dig a borehole for them? So mm -hmm. why should my parents mm -hmm. be looking for water? Mm -hmm. I had to go mm -hmm. and dig. 
Then the whole community as a whole, they had one, a community borehole. Mm -hmm. But when mm. it goes bad, contributing money to repair it becomes a problem. So these are challenges mm. that we have that makes people to, to mm. want to have their personal boreholes. Mm. So there are a lot mm. that people in power can actually do. If we have a functional society where things are well done, these are mm. things that the government can look into and begin to know how to help communities um, to curtail these things that are beginning to become uh, bad for our society. Yeah, borehole is good, but I know that in the nearest future, many people will begin to regret why did I even dig it? Because it's going to begin to have this uh, chain reaction, you know. We, Nigerians, we don't have earthquake, and I pray we don't. But these are the things that begins to create vacuum in the natural thing that we have. And by the time you know, we will begin to have those things that we weren't having before. I pray that our, every one of us will wake up and they do what we can to live in a better society. Thank you very much. And these uh, issues are not limited to you because even now where I live, we still have the same issues. Just a few of us pay for everybody's water. <laughs> so mm -hmm. thank you very much, Kelechi. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry, Choma. Uh, Apacha, mm -hmm. please go next. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for this topic. I've uh, learned a lot. And um, I just have a few things to say. But I will talk as a politician and as a professional. So I think the issue of climate change is um, something that has to be handled with a lot of care. You understand? Um, as a, as if I become president or anything like that, in a political office, I would handle with a lot of um, pragmatism and practicality. You understand? Because you know um, when you look at um, climate change, global warming, carbon emission, all these kind of things. For example. Nigeria's foreign exchange earnings comes from crude oil. So if we leave crude oil, what happens to Nigeria? How will Nigeria survive? And then we feel like a Nigeria's um, transition plan. The plan is to move from um, so-called crude oil to um, gas. And gas is still hydrocarbon, it's still carbon. So what happens? And another issue is that um, even the countries that are pushing the, the um, transition issues, they have not transist transisted yet. They are still hooked on gas. And why? It's just the issue of particularity. You understand? Um, cost determines a lot of things. When, um, when, when solar becomes as cheap as um, crude oil, people will automatically move to solar. But for now, the price of solar is a bit prohibitive compared to gas that's and crude oil. So those are things we need to look at. If the Europeans that are telling us to transist are not if not fully done it, then we should be very careful and not just um, flow the bandwagon because we will suffer for it. And besides, um, Africa accounts for less than 1% yeah, of the so-called um, global warming issue. So why should we be so concerned? And those that are really into it are not even talking much. They are still using their coal. China is still using their coal. The United States of America is using its coal. And so even some of the so-called European countries are going back to coal because they couldn't get gas from Russia. So the issues we need to really look at and be very careful before we jump. Because on the long run, you're on your own. So as a leader, you have to be pragmatic and intellectually independent. Although you must not politically um, discuss your position and dramatic about it, because definitely you can't fight the whole world. But on the long run, you should look at what works for you and your people. And that's what should come first. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Apata. So just for future questions, please let's reduce it to one minute so that others can ask. We have still have about six people waiting to ask, mm -hmm. and we have less than 10 minutes to go. But um, while you address some of your um, concerns at the end of the uh, this thing, but just to, to inform you, yes, these are some issues. But while Africa contributes to less than 1% of the greenhouse gas emission, we face most of the consequences more than other countries. And be why? Because we do not have mitigating factors. When we have floods, who suffers most? When there are floods abroad, or when there are bushfires abroad, or when there are effects of climate change abroad, how do they, re how is their um, response time? How is their reaction? How, how do the country's government react compared to uh, what, we are, what we see here? Do we have 10, 15 people die, or 100 people die in a, in a community in foreign countries? But these are the effects that we will face as Africa. So while we contribute least, we face most of the effects, which is which is why it's, it's a problem for us. Yes, but your concerns are valid, and Wale will speak to, to a lot of that. Um, so next we have Edith Young. Please go next. Please keep it on the one under one minute. 
Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Elia Senyene Dunogon. Thank you so much for the very insightful lecture you've given this evening and to that of your partner too. Um, that was quite insightful too. Yes, what I would do as a person differently, there's something I'm currently doing. I, I take it cash them young, which falls under awareness. So what I do is I, I go into schools, secondary schools particularly, talk to children, to school children about climate change and what they could do at their own level to see that they contribute positively to combat, um, to combat climate change. Uh, th that's one. And then if I were to be a politician uh, where I could influence um, um, policies and decisions of government, yes, I would still push for a change in curriculum where uh, climate education is, um, is a, um, a critical component of, um, uh, of every child's education of the school system, particularly from, even from the primary school, very positively. So I would push for an overhaul of the current curriculum we're using. Uh, the era where, if you get to not notice what is happening, geography that, we, that they used to teach us wasn't really um, that practical. Geography would have been so decentralized such that what is happening, what is feasible can be taught to children so that once they come out from the classroom, they can see the effect or what they've been taught and how they could contribute their quota to not just imagining things, but they get to see them. So that would have been my contribution. And um, I think that's just it. Let me, let me pause it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So awareness, uh, catch them young. Thank you very much. Um, Chukuka, can you go in one minute? Thank you very much. Yes, I can do it in one minute. So yes, personally, as, as an individual, what I can do and what people can do is actually keeping up the political pressure. These affected areas, these, these people affected by the effects of the climate change, they have people, they have leaders who represent them. If they continue to talk about it, continue to spread the word, continue to keep up with the pressure on the political leaders, that will help to bring about the desired change that we need. For example, it could help in creating more funds channeled towards the cause of climate change. And that funds can help in areas like awareness, perhaps the Nigerian Rotation Agency doing more, that could help in creating more funds towards the, the cause of climate change. And another thing, it can also help in policy direction. Policy in the sense that it could help uh, educate the people more. Perhaps the, the discussion and topic of climate change can be brought into the academic curriculum, taught in schools, taught in various places, maybe small organizations and small groups talking about it in not just private offices, but government offices in community groups. Funding will help if we can keep up with the political pressure. So as an individual, I believe that is what I will do differently. Thank you very much, Chukuka. Thank you very much. Strong point, political pressure, very strong point. Yes, and uh, we should all do that. So John, go on, go ahead, one minute. All right, uh, good evening, everybody. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, so um, just from um, the things we've discussed, I just want to pick out two things because um, of the time limitation of one minute. First, I think the, uh, the political elite are the ones to me that even needs more of the orientation. Our, our orientation is warped in the sense that to show that you are an elite in Nigeria, you have things like big generators and stuff. Those are the ones that you're talking about carbon, your, your carbon emission and your, your, your carbon footprint. The poor man doesn't even have the money to run these things. I'm not saying they are not part of it. They have their own role. But what I'm saying is orientation is key and it has to start from the top. That's one. Uh, we talked about borehole and all that. What is the government's view as a borehole? What they are interested in? I think there was a bill on, on, on the house uh, that was more interested in taxing people that have boreholes than even telling people the effect of borehole itself. What happened to public works? What happened to public water at a time in this country, especially in Lagos? You'll be proud. It was, it was something to be proud of that you had public water. 
But now the, the reverse is the case. You're, you show off with your ball hole. Not, we are not even told, most people don't even know, except those that are here. I'm sure the, those small folks that are even here are just hearing for the first time the dangerous effect of digging ball holes. But most of us don't know, even the elite, what, they are, what the government is concerned, it's, uh, concerned about is taxing, collecting people, oh. uh, uh, collecting tax from people. Thank, that thank you very much, Don. Yeah, very strong points. Very, very strong points. Thank you very much. Um, you. Sharon, please go not. Thank you very much. Sorry for cutting you. You had ex exited your two minutes. Sharon, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, personally, first thing is, I don't have a generator at home. My personal responsibility is I use an inverter. It was expensive to install, but it's a one-time cost. So I decided to make that sacrifice. I don't have to buy a generator fuel every, like every week, every two weeks. So that's the first thing. Second is I come from Cross River and in my local government, CCECC has been working for decades. Now we get mudslides because deforestation has gone extensively and many of these companies do not get held accountable. There's no CSR, there's no reforestation plan. So as a policymaker, first of all, when an organization or a company is coming to take your resources, they're not doing us a favor. If they didn't need us, they would not be here. So why are we afraid to tax them? Even the carbon tax is the minimum. First of all, show us your plan for, your, for the community you're going to be working in. So as a policymaker, I'm going to be ensuring that these companies are held accountable. And the minister, one minister, Tesla wanted to set up a lithium battery plant in Nigeria and they refused because they said, you're going to have to produce them here. You're not going to take our lithium and go away. I think that's a step in the right direction. But it starts from personal accountability, then holding companies and organizations, like for instance, the borehole, because it's a one-time cost, we can share that. What organizations like Public Works can do is provide a fund. We help you set it up. You pay over the course of a year. And after that year of payment, you don't pay again. Now you have a solar powered borehole for a community. It's possible, we're just not thinking about it. So I think these are the three instances that I think are ways we can start to change the narrative when it comes to power in Nigeria. Thank you. I apologize, thank I have a call. So no, my it's voice. Fine. Is... It's fine. Thank you, Sharon. These are very, thank you very much. These are, we went personal responsibility and also um, so, uh, social responsibility. Very, very strong points. Thank you very much. So Solomon, um, go ahead. Yeah, good evening, everyone. I'll just, mm. you know, we're talking about the environment and how it all affects um, all of us. One very crucial item, especially in Nigeria, is plastic materials, polyethylene, mm. terephthalate, polythene, right? Virtually everybody uses this on a daily basis. So it is very important that we check that because it is not degradable, which means um, these things last several decades in the ground, if not properly managed. And so it's, it's very important for us as individuals to realize that we must be able to recycle most of them. Instead of using a polythene, a disposable polythene bag, why not own a more hardy and more sturdy one so that you can use it over and over to the supermarket and then yeah. thereby cutting on frequent usage of all of these. And then from the government angle, government should begin to look at um, how they can eradicate the use of polythene and polyethylene terephthalate because these things do not degrade and they affect the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Solomon. Um, yes, this is, this, are very, this is a very solid point. Um, Clean Technology Hub, we just finished our Plastic Action Campaign month, um, July, and it, um, it's extended to August. And part of what we did was to um, speak with the Chairman House Committee on Climate Change to find out why the plastic ban uh, bill failed and to see how we can push it further. And we also did a lot of advocacy on this use of, um, use of plastic. We had the KAP survey on that. What, why do people use, why do Nigerians love their plastic? Because in every home you find 10 to 15 bags of plastic, you find the takeaway packs. Why do we love our plastics and why do we use them? So um, I think some of the reports can be found on, found on our website, reports of the survey, and we can, it is a very strong point. And yes, we have a plastic waste, emergency in Nigeria. So last question, then I'll read from the chat, Basil. The last comment, Basil, then I'll read from the chat and we'll round up our presentation. 
Russell, please go uh, ahead in one minute. Good evening, ECN. I want to take a cue from what has been happening in Kaduna. We have actually, in Kaduna State, progress that was made recently was uh, sadly put in reversal. There is a law in Kaduna that banned the falling of trees for the purpose of charcoal and firewood. That program helped or was supposed to help in reducing the number of trees that are felled yearly. But unfortunately, uh, the prices of gas that has just gone off the, the roof has rekindled interest in the consumption and the demand for charcoal, making it difficult to implement that program. I believe that we know that man must survive in his environment, but the truth is that for a man to survive in his environment long term, he must also plan it to make sure that the environment is sustained. Gas was supposed to be a very good option for us to move away from fossil fuel, from a falling of trees and all that. But because of the price of gas now, people are going back to charcoal. If something can be done seriously to lower than the price of gas, that is the uh, cooking gas, it really helps a lot in uh, easing the burden on our environment as regards uh, for deforestation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Basil. Very solid, yes. Um, uh, very, yes, Nigeria plays most of our gas. That's a solid, yeah, that's a, a, a big challenge for us. And um, especially with the fact that gas is actually free. It's just a transportation cost that is, is and, the gov and it taxes on gas again. So yes, those are the serious issues. So I'll just read a few comments from the chat. And um, so Kelechi said, ensuring proper disposal of waste, lending a voice to CSO's advocacy for this too. Yeah. Then in a, in a man, Emmanuel was, he says, Niman, sorry, I'm, I'm so sorry, my Tarot people will kill me for this. Niman, Emmanuel was, he says, enforcement is actually key in addressing the climate and environmental challenges in Nigeria. So many laws that will have helped in addressing the issue of flood is not being addressed. And the screen dumping of refuse and dirt without being penalized is quite unfortunate. Yes, thank you very much. So Wale, let's go to the last slide and uh, round up. Yeah, so um, while we have the um, some of the recommendations, while we have some of the climate change law at national level, um, we do not have it domesticated in states. That's why we are here with you guys. So that as we go into state house of assemblies, while we come to you to beg for, yes, yes. While we come to you to beg for this domestication of these laws, it's not strange to you. So these laws have to be domesticated at state level before we will now push for implementation. Mainstreaming climate change resilience, international and subnational planning. So if we are making national plans and we are having national um, issues, uh, the debates, um, climate change should feature in, in them. Increasing climate finance, very important. Commitment to loss and damages, especially to farmers and vulnerable groups. Full implementation of the climate change laws. It covers a lot of these issues that we have spoken about. So full implementation of the law will really, really help. Thank you very much, class. We've uh, been very amazing. Wale, back to you. Hello, everyone. It's, you'd agree with me that it's been an interesting one. Thank you so much, Aisha, to thank you for the great contributions from everybody. And quickly to address uh, Mr. Apata's question, uh, his comments generally, I, I would say, um, yeah, those are really great points. Um, understanding Nigeria's solution and also seeing how we have to both be pragmatic and also be futuristic. So. The question of transition is a matter of when, not if. So transition will happen. Uh, this is not the first time the world has transitioned when it comes to energy usage. We went from biomass to oil to coal, uh, gas, and now renewables are the future. Um, but yes, Nigeria has to be pragmatic. And I like the fact you mentioned the recently launched energy transition plan, which uh, would leverage and uh, utilize Nigeria's gas resource over the next two decades. And the goal is that by 
2050, we begin to also now see a decline in natural gas. And the essence is that, and this is some of the advocacy we've been doing, the countries that uh, are rich enough, they are the ones sort of dictating, but we are saying you can't really tell us to transition that way if we don't have the technology and the resource, we have to use what we have. So how do we use um, gas for Nigeria to how our industries are vehicles for now? As we then by 2060, the goal is Nigeria who um, have material emissions and that place we see uh, people got clean cooking, moving even not just now gas now, but also moving that uh, people can cook with electricity. Uh, but we, you would agree with me that the rate at which um, the grid is extending, uh, some communities would not get power over the next 50 years. So how then do we begin to look at uh, the subsidies that have sort of failed in, in the um, oil space? How do we get it into renewables? How do we begin to subsidize for last mile communities that don't have enough access to electricity at the moment, but they need it uh, to power their productivity? How do we then get them to get solar mini grid, solar dryers, and all this? So these are really important topics and we must keep the debate going. And thank you for your amazing contribution. It's always a pleasure interacting with everyone. Thank you. Back to you, Adisha. All right, thank you very much. Such an interesting class. Thank you, Mr. Luwali Hamon. Thank you, Aisha to Ella John. In fact, I think that I would have loved the class to continue going on because I think this is a very important discussion and conversation that we need to keep having. And awareness, like most of us have rightly said, is key and important. On this note, I'd like to say a very big thank you to everyone that has been a part of today's class. Thank you very much. Classes continue tomorrow at 5 p.m. same time on this, the same uh, platform, Zoom. I'm sure we keep receiving updates on the Telegram channel. On behalf of the college, I'd like to say thank you once again to our resource persons and facilitators and hope that you would always see, always have joy to come share with uh, students of the Electoral College. It's always a pleasure. Uh, HOP, Lisa, I don't know if you have one or two words to say before we wrap this up. Okay. Okay, if she has no words to say, I'd like to say thank you and good night. Please uh, share your thank yous in the chat box, thanking our facilitators for a job well done and for adding knowledge to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you and good night. See you tomorrow. Good night. Thank you.